Hi, this is Charlie Matotuiello with Blue Bear Flutes, our website bluebearflutes.com where you can find not only Native American flutes for sale, but also information about Native American flutes, how they are made, how to uh, play them, so much other great information we have there, as well as lists of videos and downloadable content and just some of everything we try to offer. Um, we also offer about as many how to make videos as we do how to play videos. And then we try to add a few other Native American flute videos in between. And uh, for those of you who are more interested in how to play videos, they are definitely on their way. We've got so many of those coming up. And how to make videos, usually these days when I have someone say, Charlie, how do you make this or how do you do that? How do you fix this? I usually reply with, I have a video for that because we have made so many videos on how to make Native American flutes that, uh, you know, there's not really many questions that we haven't covered. But uh, we, my wife actually had posted the query earlier on our Facebook page and got quite a few nice results, uh, good questions people were asking about making flutes, and I wanted to share those with you today. Uh, I'd like to stop for a minute. Don't forget to check out Blue Bear Flutes on Instagram because we have lots of really great pictures of places we've been, things we've done, flutes we've made. Sometimes they feature uh, really amazing flute totems. This one is actually not one we made. This is one a customer, a friend actually, had sent to me and uh, said, would you put this on a flute? So I put it on my favorite flute I ever made. There's a couple of videos I've talked about this one, and I've got a video where I actually made this one from one of our flute making kits, mind you, so keep that in mind. Um, and then we also have some great beginner flutes these days, some really wonderful um, really wonderful looking and playing flutes and just something else. I really enjoy them a lot myself. Anyway, enough about that, and I'm going to jump right into these quick questions a few people had asked, and I'm going to answer them to the best of my ability. Um, Jose asked, what makes the amplification of a flute stronger? Um, he's talking about basically where he's made some flutes that were loud and some weren't loud. So one thing that makes a flute loud, uh, well, I guess I should tell you the one thing that really makes it loud first is how much air you can direct under this track or in a flute that has a plug in it like this one does through this little slot, how much air you can direct across the sound edge and do it articulately. Get that air just like fine point finished right straight across the sound edge, the most of it that you can get. Now, I will stop and tell you that with smaller flutes, like these little guys here, uh, smaller flutes, even, even this little four hole flute that we're gonna talk about with another question in a moment, um, it's only about a half inch inside diameter and the length of the sound chamber of this flute is about 12, maybe 11 inches long. It's, it's pretty small. Um, small flutes can get loud easier than large flutes. Now this is a large base A that we, we have for sale on our website. This one uh, is actually pretty loud and it has to do with, as I said, how articulate, how controlled, I guess I could say, the air is going across that sound hole. That, not even the hole, don't even think about the hole and, and its placement, although the hole and the size and the shape and all that stuff is kind of important. Uh, but think about the edge and how well directed that air supply is going across the, the sharp edge of what people call the splitting edge or the knife edge. How directed that air path is going across there is the biggest thing that controls um, the volume. How well directed it is and how much air you can force across it. So, most of you who have made any flutes probably know that if you force a lot of air or if you make a deep track going across uh, the sound hole. Sometimes that sounds airy. So deep is only part of the equation. Wide is another part of the equation. Now, if you don't know already, there are flute makers out there, mild, I guess, semi-professional ones, that make really wide sound holes and wide tracks, um, but they're narrow, they're short. They're not real square. They're more rectangle, wide and short. This is a technique that people are using to make things louder in some cases. It does a fair job. However, the sound quality is going to be reflected in how close 
the actual hole itself is to the ideal hole for the size of the hole for the flute. So a certain size diameter and a certain length flute has an ideal sound hole size. And that ideal size, um, if you go over it, will cause the flute to overblow in places and underblow in others and be airy sometimes. And so there's some things there. And making the hole real narrow, making it smaller, um, will actually make it quieter. That's, the, that's like the negative uh, attribute of making the hole smaller is it's quieter. So you want to make it larger, but at the same time, there's a point where you really don't want to go any further. Um, those kind of things, I think the only place I've really mentioned it in depth has been in my book. Each, each one of the schematics in the book, any of you who may have it, uh, The Art of Native American Flute Making by Charlie and Jesse Montetriola. Uh, I say that because there are copycats out there and other books that may be similar, but not what you're looking for. Um, anyway, in the schematics, it tells you what the ideal size is for each sound hole. Now, those are relative, but they're awful close. Uh, and it's likewise relative but close for the size of the fingerings. They're, they're related, so keep that in mind. But like I said, having an articulate track is the number one most important thing. And articulate means the edges of the track need to be square. And just to make sure we're on the same page, we're talking about the track that's under this block right here that directs the air from the air supply chamber back here uh, and over the sound hole right here in the splitting edge. That track needs to be clear and clean and finely devised, which will lead into another question. So I'm gonna leave that off right there and go ahead and go into the next question that I had uh, was by Ernest. And Ernest says, how can someone make the track, oh, this is the other question, area and cutting edge consistently? That is an excellent question. I mean, all these are really great questions. The last one was great. Uh, this one is great. Um, a very detailed video for those kind of things uh, to have it sink in um, and adding any tools or machines to, to do it and how it's done. Um, that's a great question. So I'm going to answer that in two parts. Number one, if you're making a flute, uh, and notice I said a flute, then I would recommend using some medium fine sandpaper. You can carve the track out with a knife. You can carve it out with like an exacto knife or a push blade. Um, you can carve it out with a Dremel if you're careful. Uh, I turn the Dremel down on a really slow speed and I prefer like maybe a quarter inch wide round bit that's not, not a circle, it's like a drum um, that's made for wood, mind you and you can carve that track out pretty fine and articulately. And this is without using burning tools like I use. I mean, burning tools are great. And really, in my opinion, the best way, we finish all of our tracks with burning tools for num numerous reasons. But um, the thing that you wanna look for, the thing that you're trying to achieve, a flute, mind you, um, is clean sidewalls of the track. If you can imagine for a moment, this tiny little track inside of these flutes, uh, if you can imagine that track um, having perfectly straight edges that make 90 degrees and it has a flat surface in the bottom of the track and then it is directed most importantly in a straight path not like this not like that I mean like that's okay but definitely not like that uh, you don't want it to dip down into the sound hole it's okay to round the bevel the edge but you don't want the track to, to taper down into the sound hole. You want it to either be going straight across as possible or slightly up at an angle and then have it beveled on that little edge there. That bevel really makes a world of difference. Keeps the flute from jumping octave. Uh, it makes your low notes come out really good. There's so many other videos I guess I could make. Like I said, we've got so many videos and I think I've mentioned that in two or three. But, but uh, So if you're making a flute, that's what you want to do. If you're making multiple flutes, how can you get them Consistent, basically, is what he's asking. And making them consistent is a, it's a, it's a trick. It takes a little bit of this if you're doing it by hand, or a lot of this if you're doing it with a machine. Milling machines, um, they're not terribly expensive. You could do it with a milling machine. You can do it with a drill press if you have a fine quality drill press that when you turn it on, you don't hear the chuck rattling inside of it. If the chuck's rattling, like if you have a, a lower grade drill press, you can tighten those kind of things. There's a screw on the side of it to tighten that. Anyway, long story short, 
If you have a drill press and you put a milling bit in it and turn the speed up to about 1100 RPMs uh, or higher, I mean, some drill presses go much, much higher. If you did that, you could pull it down and presumably if your drill press allows you to lock it in place, you could lock it in place having the, the flute set in a, in a position and then you can slide it. Now there are people who, who make the tracks like that. There's another way you can do it with a similar bit to the one I mentioned with the Dremel and that is, and, and using the drill press. Put the drill press down, uh, have the bit right here that protrudes whatever width of track you're trying to create and then um, have a backstop behind the bit and you can you could take the flute like this and push it up to the bit, slide it that way and pull it back out and come out with a pretty articulate, very quick solution to that. Um, a milling machine, a little bit higher dollar, that's how you produce high quality and consistent tracks. A CNC machine, same thing. Uh, CNCs are basically milling machines and you wanna use a milling bit. Uh, but like I say, quick and on the fly, uh, having control over what you're doing with practice, mind you. The burning tools that we use is quick, easy, relatively consistent. Um, you can use one that is a width of your track or you can use one that's narrower, smaller than your track and then go back over it two or three times. But it takes uh, persistence of, of uh, checking it to make sure it's right and then you know just basically doing the same thing each and every time. So you can do it that way or if you want to get real fancy like I said you can have a milling machine with a program um, and just have it run that same program each and every time but I really like it by hand. Machines don't make flutes, people do. Um, so good question Ernest. William, how do you do inlays on flutes? I've been waiting for 11 years for somebody to ask me that question. I think I might have had it once and I may have put them off, but William, I've known you long enough. Yes, a very good question. I think we're just gonna make some videos on that. Um, a Dremel is a good tool to have with, a, with like a rounded bit. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you the process really quick because I don't wanna go too long into time. But um, the, uh, the process, you can do it a number of different ways. Uh, if you're inlaying something that is of a consistent size, like let's say you went to a bead shop or a craft store and you bought something shaped like a, a, a Firebird or a Thunderbird or you know something like that or something that's round or hard or, or whatever, you can take that item and set it on top of the flute and trace it out with a pencil. That's a good start. Tracing out with a pencil is a good way to go. Then you can use any number of tools to, to etch out the shape there so that it's close to the thing that you're looking for. Or you can use, like I say, a Dremel or other rotary tool, uh, anything that's gonna help speed up the process, but my God, watch those fingers. You have no idea how many times I thought, well, this will be a good rotary tool, and I get it, and it's like a milling bit that's made for a Dremel, and I just sliced off the top of my thumbnail. That image, everybody's at home cringing right now, that image is one that'll hopefully stop you from ever doing it. I did it twice. I don't know why I didn't learn the first time. But so be real careful with these things. And look, I know that we all hate wearing gloves or whatever when we use tools, but I'm gonna promise you, if you had a leather glove in, on your less dominant hand and your dominant hand, you had a rotary tool that, you know, that is something you're gripping, you're grasping it, and it's, it's not gonna get away from you that way. Holding away from your face, got goggles on, you know, we're getting very tech here. Um, and then, if you slipped and it ground into that leather, you'll be like, huh, that wasn't too bad, I hope. Um, but be careful, whatever you do, please be careful. There's ways to do all this stuff as people have since time immemorial that, that people have ground things into wood and inlaid different stuff. If I sat here you know, with my knife and etched that design, if I drew a heart out and etched that design, I could eventually have it deep enough that I could do step two, William, that I was promising to tell you here. Um, when you inlay it into the wood, of course, you don't want to have finished the flute yet. You don't want to have uh, too much of anything on. If you're using natural finishes like we do, don't oil it first. You can do that afterwards. If you're using lacquer, you probably could lacquer it, but you'd probably be better off waiting until you're finished with your inlay. You've got it deep enough. You can go back and check it before you seal it in there. Just check it several times. You know, is this how I want it to look? Is it exactly right? Uh, if it's not, is, if it's a stone or another piece of wood or metal or anything like that, is it something I can sand off 
and it's not going to ruin the finish of this device or this item that I'm putting in there. Is it something that I can uh, I can sand to make it flush with the flute? There's a few things to consider, but most importantly, when you have it set to the side that you want, the size that you want, then you can go back and glue it in. I use super glue. You know, it, it's really the best thing to hold. There are so many other things, and depending on what the item is, I might would use something like an epoxy or like a, a multi-part mineral enriched resin. Uh, JB weld is what most people call it. Um, any of that kind of stuff uh, works great and you can mix a color in whatever it is that you're you're using except for super glue you got to be real careful with that stuff it doesn't even like wood don't get it around your eyes the vapors are terrible but if you're using an epoxy you can actually use a color that matches the stone or other item that you're inlaying and that color will act as a a um, an highlighter around it so it'll it'll kind of fill in some of the gap where it wasn't exactly the right size you wanted. So there's a lot of things you can do there. Uh, inlaying, you know, oddly shaped stones and such as that, not too difficult, same process, but you got to figure out where you want to go with this. Do you want a, a big rock poking off the top of it or how you want it to do? Thanks so much, William. We're going to be making some videos on that. Uh, Jim, great question. Um, and this one, Jim, you've been with us for a while. I appreciate you asking. Uh, don't take this the wrong way. That is a fantastic question, and I, I really need people to hear the answer to it. Uh, and like I said, don't take this the wrong way because it's so simple. I'll never forget those words when I asked my granddad. He showed me how to make this little four-hole whistle. I said, where do you put the holes? He said, put them wherever you want to. Um, I've mentioned that in another recent video, the one I think right before this one. Um, I didn't say anything about my granddad in that particular video, but about where you want to put the holes. Um, that's something that, uh, that we're going to make another video about as well. But, is the center of the flute measured from the front of the sound hole or the rear of the sound hole? Um, you know, I can tell you a couple of things that will answer that question, kind of. My dad's comment, six of one <laughs> and half a dozen of another, meaning basically it's e either way. Um, this ain't rocket science is another one I say a lot. Um, but it's, it's a really excellent question, like I said, I want people to know the answer to this question, but I just want to let you know it is not that pertinent. Some people will delve into it and that is so critical to get it exactly right. Um, it's like when you're cutting a 2 by 4 or piece of plywood, um, are you the kind of person, and I don't mean Jim, I mean anybody, are you the kind of person who cuts it on the side of the mark or on the mark? And if it's not that, do you cut it on the inside of the mark? There's not many of those. Those are usually unskilled professionals, but people either cut it on the outside of the mark or on the mark. So in other words, if you have a piece of wood and you draw a line on it, do you cut that line or do you cut over the side of the line? To me, it really depends on what I'm making. If I need that, you know, two millimeters of an inch, the half width of a, of a table saw blade, I'm gonna cut it on the outside of the line. If I don't mind the, the uh, width, then I'm going to cut it down the line. So it kind of kind of depends. But, like I said, for your question, most importantly, it really depends on where you're getting the instruction from. I usually measure everything from the center of the sound hole. And the reason I do that is it gives me a range. It gives me an average. Um, and that average means that if you make the sound hole this big, you're still in the center and you're right on the money. If you make the sound hole this big, which is just a little larger, then you may be a millimeter off one direction or another, but you're still uh, measuring from the same place, which is critical, you know, so that's important. But there again, you know, I will tell you, it's a very smart question you've asked. It really is, but I want to make sure that I answer it in a way that doesn't confuse you or lead you astray. It's general. It really is so general. Um, if you make the variance uh, of your sound hole one way or the other, that will change the tone of the flute. You're exactly right in asking this question. But there's so many other variables. There are thousands, I mean, just ridiculous number of other variables. Um, like whether you have the, the plug, for lack of a better term, inside of the flute behind the back edge of the sound hole, that changes the tone. Whether you make a square or a rectangle sound hole changes the tone. Whether your track is straight or going up at an angle, like I mentioned earlier, changes the tone. 
whether your track is a quarter of an inch wide or is it three sixteenths of an inch wide. All this stuff changes the tone so much. Keep it, keep it general and you'll be so much happier and everybody else will. And Jim, I thank you so much. It's a question I've had several times and I just, I hope that I answered it in a way that helps people to understand that it does matter, but it really doesn't, don't get tied up in it. I mean, I, I really wouldn't worry about it myself. I mean, we, we made like a thousand flutes last week. I, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, Marion, been with us for a long time. Thank you so very much, Marion. Uh, anytime I get to talk to you on the phone or anything, it's always an honor. I appreciate it. Uh, does the thickness of the flute wall change the sound of the flute? Absolutely. That is a great question. Once again, another one that would probably make a good video. I think before my wife showed me all these questions, uh, we both agreed that a lot of them made um, you know good uh, good videos to follow up. So, uh, like a Stradivarius violin, and I hope he'll forgive me for mentioning his name, but uh, on such a simple instrument. But like a Stradivarius, the thickness of the wood, the placement of the wood, everything makes so much of a difference in the tone. Um, and, and falling back on my comment with Jim, Mary, we can use that as well. Um, you know, it, it kind of matters and it kind of doesn't. You know, we don't want to get too hung up on it because what we want to do is create something that can be played and sounds good. Everything else is just like the, the path that gets you here. It kind of matters, it really does. For the longest time, I made flutes with really thin sidewalls. Some people complain because they, they are afraid that it's gonna break. And I've got, if, if my flutes can withstand what I put them through and not break them, we're in good shape. But I always test them. I don't want it to be squishy or so thin that I can change its shape with my finger. Um, but the thickness does make a difference. If you make a wall thickness that is more than a 3 eighths of an inch, that's really pushing it for sound quality. What happens is, as these vibrations, and I'm gonna show you an example of like a sine wave, as the vibrations are traveling down the flute and they're going like this, they have a shape. They have um, a size, an apex, I think is the name of it in mathematical terms. When the arc, when the vibration arcs up here at the top and starts to head back down, there's a size that fits that particular vibration best. So that's a consideration. Um, in, in my original creation of our flute patterns, which are, there again, all, most of them are based on an original Cherokee flute pattern, which is this little guy here. Uh, in my original creation of these, these patterns, there were two things that I thought of. Number one, what created the best sound? And number two, what is the easiest for somebody to play? That's why I'm holding a five hole, uh, a flute here with two holes in the front and one in the back because somebody with small hands, excuse me, four holes in the front, uh, thank you so much camera person, uh, and one hole in the back because it's easier for a person with smaller hands to play this. Now I have medium sized hands as I've mentioned in several videos and I can play all of our flutes but this here is so much more comfortable to me than putting this extra fingering up here on the top. It's, it's kind of a stretch. My finger's not made to move that way uh, and this isn't historically traditional either and, and neither is a base a flute so uh, six of one and half a dozen of another but but with regards to the thickness of the flute as those vibrations are traveling up and down inside of this this chamber and hopefully we've got the chamber to a reasonable size that matches the size of the vibrations of the tone and there again we're talking about a mean um, average of the vibrations not the size of the bass note or the high note it's the mean average um, when we're talking about that, some of that vibration as it travels soaks into the wood. It, it um, I guess it, it just absorbs some of it. It's the best way to say it. That's why I've always preached soft wood flutes because the soft woods absorb a lot of the sound and create really beautiful sounding instruments, plus they're closer to historical. Uh, Native people didn't make hard, you hear that? This one's made out of poplar. It's a good wood for, for me in the shop. Uh, it makes great flutes for customers and it has a great sound that I really enjoy. But historically, natives probably never made flutes out of poplar. It may have happened that it would have been a sapling, which are easier to work than a, a large cured piece of wood. So hardwoods don't absorb as much simply because they're uh, more tightly packed and hardwoods um, tend to be more brassy sounding. Same thing with putting lacquer on a flute. The lacquer causes some of the vibrations not to escape 
through the actual wood itself. When I play this flute here, I can, this flute here, I can really feel um, the way that the, uh, the flute vibrates. I can really feel that, it's amazing, you know, and, and it's my connection to this instrument outside of my hearing it. And, and that's important. And you wouldn't get that vibration as much if the wood was really thick. So, uh, it, and it's not just that, I don't know if you want to call it spiritual connection. It's not just that, but it's the sound as well. So, um, not too thin that it loses its structural integrity. Not too hard that it, it might as well have been a piece of brass. And um, not too thick, especially because there again, it's like a concrete block wall. You know, if we were inside of a concrete room, people couldn't hear me scream outside of it. And if we were in a double layer concrete room, they couldn't hear hundreds of us screaming in this room. I don't know why that come to me, why, why I'm using that as an example. But, but anyway, probably some horror movie I've seen recently. But, but anyway, you know, that's something to think about. So think about a concrete block building and whether or not you can hear people outside of it. And then think about a wood building, which is a lot softer material than concrete blocks. Uh, and typically thinner and yeah, you can hear your neighbors probably if you live next to somebody uh, Yelling through your your house or your dogs if they're outside howling because uh, your coon dogs miss going to the groomers <laughs> But anyway, let me make sure I've got all these questions because I know there's one more oh, oh Grant, thank you. If you make the track too deep is there a way to fix it without starting over? Look at the link in the comments or in the in the uh, description of this video, and there's a video that we've made on how to do that, which is a really good help. It basically boils down to putting something inside of the track area um, that will help you bring it back up to the to the surface. Don't feel bad about that um, when you do that, Grant, because that's something that we have to do on occasion. Sometimes. Uh, when I'm eyeballing something, I may go too deep, or there may be a flaw in it, which is another another thing that happens. If there's a crack in your track, <laughs> don't throw it back. Okay, it's okay. You can you can fix this by putting some uh, IU super glue there again, and and uh, I usually use some sawdust in there. But I've heard of people using things like baking soda and whatever, but I stick with sawdust. It works really good. As a matter of fact. The sawdust that I prefer to use is poplar sawdust because it'll match color with just about anything that we do and is very consistent, so that's good stuff. If I need a dark finish um, uh, sawdust in something, if I'm using it to fill a, a knot hole or something, I'll use uh, burnt poplar wood and it does really great. But like I said, we have a video on repairing tracks that are too deep. We've recently made a video on repairing fingerings the same way, which is good. Then we have Steve here. How would a flute be tuned and the finger placements be decided without measuring tools. Well, there is what I, as a Native American, like to call a wives' tale that has floated around for the longest time. Sometimes I call it a romanticized idea, uh, which really isn't, uh, isn't too far off. Uh, for the longest time, the idea, the concept, any of you that believe this, don't, don't hate me. I, I still I appreciate you listening to my opinion. Um, there's a belief that people used knuckle lengths and thumb sizes and all this kind of stuff. And, and I don't want to say that I started that idea. I don't want to say that. But 35 years ago, I showed some people how to measure if you didn't have a tape measure. I measured by using the length of my elbow to my wrist and for making this particular flute, it's really close. It's actually, this one here that is the original size. Um, as long as the node on a piece of river cane is the distance between my wrist and my elbow, it'll make a good flute. Uh, so that's, that's something you've got to consider. People did use whatever they had. Uh, one thing that South and Central American Native people used was a piece of string with knots tied on it. It's a really, and I say string, you know, a woven cord, you can call it whatever you want to. Um, but, uh, but that's a good technique. Does that mean that every Native American flute was made with the thumb sizes, the width of your thumb, the distance between two fingers here and whatever there? No. And it just, it's like that, that third fingering on a, on a modern six hole flute that doesn't really have, it doesn't serve a purpose other than mode one and mode two, <laughs> which we talked about in the last video. Um, I've known some Apache 
friends of mine who have huge hands. They have like a bear's paw for a hand. They have short fingers, but their fingers are all about as wide as my my two fingers together. I've got two Apache friends that I, I remember back in the day, we used to compare fingers. Um, but uh, so their fingers would make a different size flute. What you may not know and conceive is that the size and diameter of the flute and the length of the flute determines the placement of the fingerings to a big degree. And so that's a, that's a thing that's really important. If you put those fingerings in different places and it stayed the same length and the same diameter, it's gonna cause the flute to play like wacky out of tune, like there's not a scale to describe it. Uh, so that's a thing to, to consider. So, but does that mean that this concept isn't one you could use? You actually can use it, yes, absolutely. Because if you know that you're always making flutes that are three quarters of an inch diameter, and you know that the space between this top hole and this next hole is as big as your little finger, then that works good for you, and you can keep doing that. If you share this information with someone, it may or may not work depending on what size and diameter they're making and how big their hands are. So keep that in mind. Um, I can't say that that is a historical Native American idea. The only people I have known to suggest this idea is actually historical are people of the Native American flute community, <laughs> which have a lot of interesting ideas. Not, not bad ideas though. And Steve, thank you so much for asking that question. It's a great question. Um, you can make and I have made on occasion uh, sticks to measure things. My dad taught me a long time ago, if you need to know how wide something is and you don't have a measuring tape by you, uh, tie a piece of uh, string, tie knots so that you'll know how wide it is. I've measured uh, the brake calipers on my old Ford pickup truck with that. I've done all kinds of things and used a stick to determine whether or not you know my hubs will fit somebody else's car by determining the distance between the, the lug nuts with a stick. So we can do those things, but it's not consistent for flute making uh, unless you're the one and you own that stick. And anyway, uh, Tushka asked a question, how many did you mess up before you got it right uh, for the discouraged? And that's a great question. It really is. And uh, this is another one of those questions like Williams earlier that I've, I've really been waiting for somebody to officially come out and say this because, you know, it helps to answer that question. Uh, <clears throat> So honestly, I think my first flute I ever made was a success. And probably what has made me the flute maker that I am today and making as many flutes as we make today and have done these videos like I make today, the thing that has gotten me here is probably my first five or six were perfect. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to brag. They're not perfect, perfect. I mean, not like this guy here's, you know, this is like, I can't even put a number on this. I don't know what number this is. This is one I made a couple of months ago. This is the only flute that I've ever played that I, I really absolutely just absolutely. It took me millions of flutes to get that one. So, you know, perfect. Anyway, so um, I, I made about five or so of them that were really great. And that's when I started messing up. But the good news is, Tushka and everybody else, especially if anybody's discouraged as he suggested, you know, uh, that's what this question is for, is for the discouraged. I've helped a lot of people make flutes, and that's taught me a lot. It really has. It's taught me a, a lot. It's taught me patience. It's taught me how to appreciate people on every walk of life and so many other things I couldn't even share with you here. I'll start getting misty-eyed if I do. But uh, watching people make their first flute, when it makes that first sound, it's been so magical for me, and I'm, I'm sitting back giggling you know in my mind thinking oh this is the coolest thing because I got somebody to do something I helped them to do something or even inspired them to do something if I didn't help them that just really blew them away you know and and they did it themselves I didn't do it they did it and and it takes you know some years sometimes for people to realize I'm not the one that made the flute that they made they did it like you touch I know you've made a good handful so um but the thing I've learned by observing people is that a lot of people, about 60%, get something incredibly right the first time. You might ridicule it yourself and, and nitpick it after a while, but you get it incredibly right the first time, about 60% of people. 40% of people are struggling uh, on the beginning stages. 
And the struggle is always this right here. It's that sound hole and that track. And that's why we have the video, Secret to Flute Making. We have countless other videos about perfecting the track is one of them. Uh, there's several other, other really great videos that we've made on, on how to do that. We'll probably put some of those in the description there if anybody wants to go back and revisit those. Uh, and if you do, please share them. I, I don't know if I've ever mentioned that. Sharing our videos really helps us out a lot. But um, so they struggle with that sound hole. As soon as you get the sound hole, the rest of it's pretty easy. And even if it's not perfect after you get the sound hole right and it produces that really great quality sound, uh, you're happy with it. So, so I, I made about five good ones before I messed up one. Uh, and it's not to say I haven't messed up a bunch of them. I've actually, let's see, unrepairable in the shop. We probably threw away maybe two flutes last week. And that'd be the most we've thrown away in probably a month, but but unrepairable. And those are things that are just, you know. And then there's there's boxes. You don't know about these boxes. And, and we might even offer some of them on Facebook here sometime or another. But there's these boxes of flutes that are like unfinished all around my shop. There must be several hundred of them that have gotten to a point that I'm like, you know, this one's not really going to be a good one. Let's set it aside. Um, there has been a time in the past when we've sold those. And we're probably going to do have a Blue Bear Flutes Yard sale again. Uh, and they're not seconds. They're not finished. A lot of them. I did see a triple drone in one that I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna offer up. So forgive me for that. I'm just telling you. I look at it every day and think I'm gonna take this triple drone out before one of our employees is cleaning and puts it somewhere I can't find it. I'm probably gonna save that one. But the rest of them are all up for grabs. There's drones in there and, and drilled out flutes and just all kinds of stuff. I've got it. And some of them are, are blanks that haven't been glued together. And there's all kinds of stuff to consider. Um, so we do make mistakes, yeah, but it's it's not really so much that it's a mistake and it's not as good as the ones I'm perfecting. Um, so that's a way to look at it and it might help others look at it too. Uh, like I said, that question, Tushka, is really a great a great way to help others, especially if you're, you know, you got to look at it. You're either in the 40% or the 60%. The 60%, okay, I didn't tell you this, their second flute usually doesn't turn out good. And, and this is st this is Charlie's statistics. Uh, Y'all might not know, I speak several languages. I have a mild phot photographic memory. Um, and I, I remember statistics. I was looking at something today and I told a guy this building square, 1,200 square feet. And he went and counted all the thing, the tiles in the ceiling. And he's like, okay, and he, he multiplied 30 times 40 uh, feet wide. And I'm like, he's like, wow, how did you do it? And this is an engineer. That just blew out of the water by walking into a room telling us 1,200 square feet. I can see that kind of stuff. I can see statistics about things, and I pay attention to a lot of numbers. People who have made flutes perfectly the first time, uh, that's 60%. Um, only a handful of them make their second one perfect. And then even a smaller handful make the third one perfect. Um, it's that pursuit of doing it. It's that uh, drive that keeps you doing it, and eventually you get where a lot of them turn out really good. Uh, so keep that in mind, but 40%, don't feel bad. You're not in a minority. That's, that's uh, modern terminology. I don't, I don't go for that. Uh, that 40%, you just got to find that one thing that'll help you make it play. And once you get it to play, the rest of it's a breeze. Uh, so remember that 40% of you, if you, if your first flute doesn't turn out perfect, don't throw it away. Uh, we have videos on how to repair anything you've done wrong. And if you can't find a video, I can send you a link to it. If I don't have a video to fix whatever it is that you did to that flute <laughs> that made it not perfect or made it not play, um, send me a picture of it. You'd be surprised. I'll tell you exactly what to do with it. it and it's not throw it away or burn it or whatever kind of crazy ideas you might have. So let's get to these last couple questions before my camera person falls asleep and my kid goes hungry. Uh, let's see here. So, Stephen, this is the last one before I get to the one in Messenger. Stephen, if I were making a flute for a one-handed veteran, how would I tune it? That is a great question, Stephen, um, and reference to upcoming videos. I would like to start by telling you, let's see, my oldest boy is almost 24, and he was about, what was he, about eight when we were at that 4-H camp, does that sound about right? He was about two. Okay, so so we're talking 21 or 22 years ago. Uh, we were at a 4-H camp, and we had some people who had volunteered to help us, which is great. Um, and we were making flutes for the 4-H people. So this is about 22 years ago, give or take. And um, so we were there in the story. <laughs> I know some of you are like stories. Uh, but uh, we were there, and one of the assistants was a previous 
lineman for a power company. And I don't know, you won't ever probably meet your power lineman. You won't. Not unless there's a hurricane or some catastrophe that they had to come out and fix or they're doing something. But if you do meet them, thank them. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you, it's, it's a difficult job. Um, there are things that come of it that aren't, aren't pleasant. A lot of linemen that I have met in my life are missing their thumbs um, because uh, the power from a power line, even 120 volts that you're plugging in your wall here, up on the power line is, a, is just powerful. And it's enough that when it touches your body, it doesn't cause you to get a burn or an arc or a zap. It actually, um, I'm trying to think of a way of not giving you really bad visions here. The only word, uh, go ahead, go ahead and write it down. I'm, uh, destroy, yeah, that's a good way. I was going to say explode, but, but uh, destroy is probably a lot easier image for you to digest. It destroys your your whatever it touches. This lineman, don't lose me in the story here, this lineman that was helping us at this 4-H camp 20 some odd years ago make flutes uh, with a whole bunch of 4-Hers. We needed help because there's so many of them and keep them steady and line them up. And, and he was actually very, very driven. So he, uh, he helped the students drill holes. We had a drill press here. He helped them drill holes in the flutes. Um, he helped them put the blocks on. He helped them tie the flute blocks the last couple of them he helped them we had people stationed set up and everything and as a lineman he had lost both of his arms at the elbow this man and and i want you to remember who it is we're talking about in this the comments here the question stephen had asked if i were making a flute for a one-handed veteran how would i tune it and thank you veteran also for for what you went through i've got family members that had gone through things and lost a lot of stuff as well so um the lineman made a flute by himself without my help, following our instructions. He tied the leather on it. He played it. Um, he had some difficulty, and he, he said, jokingly, uh, that he was going to have to practice a little bit to be able to play all the notes, <laughs> which is just incredibly cool. But he didn't have any hands. Um, so I'm not going to forget that guy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Historically, though, especially for your veteran friends who are missing arms and, and anything and, and people with uh, arthritic problems and people with diabetic problems. And there's a lot of realms that this will dive into. Uh, this four hole whistle that I have videos for how to make, this one's made out of PVC. I've got a video for how to make that one as well as ones made out of other materials. Uh, this four hole whistle was historically something that native people played play with one hand. So you can do that. You can play this in a major scale, a minor scale, anything with one hand, which is incredibly cool. It's harder to play the larger four hole flutes, which we're about to have some videos on how to, how to make these. It's harder to play them with one hand, unless you have some way to steady it. If you have some way to steady it, not covering this hole up mind you, but if you can steady it, I can play this larger four hole flute. With some practice, I could get really good at it. Uh, the little four holes I do, play them sometimes when I'm driving my car, don't tell the police that, but, uh, <laughs> and I'm not recommending you try driving a stick shift 88 model hot rod driving it and playing this flute in the other hand. I'm not recommending you do that, <laughs> but you can play it in a safe place uh, with one hand. So that's a consideration. I personally like to play with two hands. I like to think I'm, I'm communing with aliens when I do that. Cause you know, in the movies, aliens always have like two fingers on top, really long ones and one under the bottom. So it works out really good. If you think about this as being for aliens, and, and I'll be honest with you too, it, it actually makes me think differently when I'm playing this flute than I do when I think about playing these other flutes. But this one might be of interest to you as well. This is a two-hole flute, had a lot of requests, especially by my Aztec dancer friends, 
uh, on how to make these and so I'm, I'm going to be doing a video really soon about this. The neat thing about this is with the sound hole, uh, excuse me, with the bottom tuning hole of the flute being so close to your finger, you can partially cover it. Anyway. I was doing something the other day. Anyway, to let you know how amazing this thing is. Now, there's a lot of notes you can play on this little guy. I'm going to show a video on how to make this. I know a lot of you, especially if you like that, please make sure you tell me something in the comments. I can't wait to see that video. And I'll try to light a fire under my tail and make it happen soon. So let me pull up this one other question that I've got, and we'll make this really short video here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Uh, make this really short video here. Where am I at? There I am. Um, a little shorter. So let's get to this question. Uh, you need to switch accounts. Okay. There we go. And this is from Bertrand. Is that right? Bertrand? Okay, great. Uh, Bertrand had sent this message in the question. He actually, uh, or she, I don't know. Bertrand, anyway, thank you, Bertrand, um, sent this message um, to us instead of posting any questions because my wife had already turned off the comments, and this was a great one, and I thought we should probably follow up. So, uh, let me see. Da, da, da. Is there a ratio about the sound hole, sound dimension, and chamber diameter? Thanks so much for answering uh, your help in general. So, just to explain this a little bit more in depth, and, and this is actually a question I've, I've answered during this question thing here. Um, is there a ratio about the sound hole and dimensions and chamber uh, diameter? And there really is. Now, to start, you may not know this, but there is a um, flute measurement tool online. There's about three of them. Uh, some of the creators of these measurement tools have approached me back in the years past and have been like, aren't you glad I'm making this? I'm like, mm. earlier I said, people make flutes, not machines. And so <laughs> there's a movie, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, but basically there was a, a mathematician. Uh, I think it's called something like Pi, but it's not the life of Pi. Is it called Pi? It, it might be pi, P-Y-E, P-I-E. It might be just the pi symbol. Uh, it could be spelled in Greek or something. I don't remember. But anyway, there was a young man who was a math genius. And um, this group of, of Jewish mathematicians, which is, uh, is a very interesting um, group, had approached him because he had found the ratio of God. And he was the only person in history to ever discover it. And he's... Uh, uh, Hebrew mathematicians and Jewish religious religious mathematicians had been searching for this forever and and so they praised him for finding this he, they knew he was on the right track and then they they praised him for finding it and then at the end of the movie he harmed himself so that he couldn't produce these kind of uh, mathematical equations anymore and it's not a it's not a like a true story or anything to my knowledge um, but it does make you think so there is a ratio for everything. There's a ratio for the diameter versus the inside diameter of the flute versus the diameter of the, the sound holes, the fingerings, uh, everything. There's a ratio for that, but it's not one. This is, and, and I'm, I'm, you'll forgive me, I don't always incorporate my spiritual beliefs and everything. I probably ought to, but I, I don't. Um, but that's where you're starting and i'm not talking about <laughs> the american or even the european concept of what god is some uh i'm not being rude some white man with a beard probably a grecian type figure wearing a robe sitting on a throne somewhere i'm not perpetuating that idea uh, but you are when you're starting to look for those numbers um, you are tugging on on 
God's jacket there on, on God's robe. And I, uh, I have found that I don't need to ask that question. It's not, it's not one of the, like the list of questions I've got for when I, <laughs> uh, stereotypically go or arrive at the pearly gates. <laughs> oh my gosh. I probably should have a video one day on my, my spiritual beliefs, but I, I don't want to do that. I don't think, I don't think it's a good idea. And then, <laughs> I don't know. I, I've studied a lot of religions, and and uh, uh, that's just not, I'm not like that. But anyway, I've seen gates. I'll tell you that, but they're not what you think. Uh, anyway, um, so when you're trying to find the exact ratio, You'll, you'll expend a lot of energy and a lot of time trying to search for that and trying to say, if I change it this much, does it change it that much? The people who have created these uh, calculators online, they use some generalizations that are not accurate. Uh, and I'm not putting you all down if you're watching this video. I'm just saying, if you want to be specific and start tugging on those, those coattails, you need to get specific. And I could tell you some specifics about the insides of flutes that you haven't considered, I promise you, because you can't make a key of A flute that is five inches in diameter, that is this long, and place the fingerings on it in a place that, that really are going to be good for a human being to play. Uh, and then on top of that, you're going to have to make them a certain diameter. And I'm speaking to the people that create these, these calculators, not general folks. Uh, so if, if you're going to make a key of A flute, once again, using your calculator that's five inches in diameter, it's going to be about nine inches long. I can do a lot of that in my head. Um, and then your fingerings are going to be of substantial caliber, and they're going, to, they're going to be in such positions that you're going to have to offset them, and they're going to have a tendency to overblow every single fingering. <sighs> it's not necessary. It's not necessary to calculate, the, and I'm not... Um, putting Bertrand here down, no, thank you so much for your question. Um, I, and I hope this helps you to understand my concept, my belief on this. It's not necessary to calculate those things because I've shared those schematics with everybody that work for me. Not only do they work for me, but for me, the calculated size of the inside diameter of the flute that I offer my schematics for produce uh, a finer quality tone. Here's an example for you. This is an A flute that is made on a historical pattern that is about a half inch inside diameter. I can barely stick my little finger in it, and it only goes that far. And this is the tone that it produces. Some of you may like the tone. Now listen to the tone, not the note spacing. Think about that. So this is about an A, and it's very long and very skinny. Not what a lot of higher end <laughs> wonderful people make for flutes. A lot of them make a flute that's about an inch in diameter, which for me, an A, an inch in diameter is a mistake. Uh, this one's about three quarters, 19 millimeters, give or take, in diameter. You notice immediately it's louder, but that's because of some juju I put on it. Uh, <laughs> but the size of the diameter of the flute will make a better quality sound uh, tone, even tonally. This B flute here, it's a high B, which is a, a step above this A and that A, produces a better tone quality than this original pattern size, this original flute. The reason I don't make flutes on this original pattern size, instead I use a, an original Cherokee pattern, instead of original six hole pattern, is because this has a tiny sound hole. It'll pr produce a certain amount of volume and it will make a flute that most people will not be necessarily happy with playing based on their skill level. And I'm not saying you need to work up to playing this because it's not like that. You know, you play what makes you happy. That's what's important. I do sell currently uh, six hole flutes in the key of A and G, two historical sizes and patterns on our website. And the A looks just like this one, except for it's made out of poplar. Um, so um, consider that. But um, if you make a long flute and without drilling the holes in it, which this is an up, another upcoming video, if you make that and you produce an F sharp uh, and it's long, but it's only about a half inch in diameter, that is not going to be conducive to a good F sharp flute. 
And if you send me this flute dimensions and say, where do I put the fingerings? I would tell you, you're probably better off cutting about here, making a high B out of it or a high C or something like that. Maybe even a smaller, higher tone flute because um, there is a, like a relative size that produces the best tone of that particular note of that frequency. So keep that in mind. And uh, those of you, back to those guys that produce those, those tools online, thanks for trying to help the community. I appreciate that. Please, if you haven't, I haven't looked because I, I don't need your tools. I, you know, I'm not putting you down. But uh, if you haven't uh, done it, please put a disclaimer on those to let people know uh, that if you produce a rather large in whatever shape, size, it may not produce the best end results for your flute. Um, so that's something to consider. The fingerings, the diameter, there's so much of this stuff that is of a relative size that is important. It ain't rocket science, but you know, do you really need to tug on those, those coattails? How good do you think you really are? I've made a lot of flutes and I've shown a lot of people tips and techniques on making flutes and I don't feel the need to tug on those coattails. So anyway, thank you all so very much. I'm going to close this out. I appreciate all your questions. I hope this helps other flute makers out there or aspiring flute makers or people just trying to make one. If you've sat through this entire video, look, I, I appreciate you. Uh, we try not to inundate our videos with too many uh, commercials to get ad revenue off of. And eventually one day I might take all the ads down. I might put more up. I don't know what I'm going to do. I might start plugging my, this video is brought to you by Blue Bear Flutes <laughs> merch store. You know, I might do that kind of thing, but, but you know, I'm there. I'm not, I'm not trying to push that. This is about how you guys need some information and, and I hope that it helps you. So once again, Charlie Montatuyella signing out for Blue Bear Flutes and BlueBearFlutes.com. Thank you so very much. I could have made 10 videos out of it. They would have all 10 been shorter. Made one long one. Here we are. Thank you, and I appreciate you greatly. Please comment, uh, like, subscribe, click the bell notification if you haven't done that. I don't tell people that enough because uh, you really, if you don't do that, you won't know the next video comes out, and so much more. I appreciate you. Have a great day. Happy flute playing and happy flute making. See you again.